All right. Hey, everybody. And uh, thank you for joining us here to uh, have a chat about API security in the healthcare sector. Uh, I'm just going to pop a little note into the, uh, the chat. Um, love to hear from you all and where you're joining us from. Um, thanks for uh, the chats that are already popping in here. Um, so my name is Dan Barahona. I'm one of the founders uh, here at uh, Epicet University and really thrilled to be joined by Chad and, and Andrew. Um, Chad's the uh, CISO and DevSecOps lead over at Surist, um, in large insurance provider. And we've got uh, Andrew Mahler, VP of Privacy and Compliance over at Clearwater. Um, two really interesting guys that bring different perspectives uh, on the healthcare industry. And we're going to be having a whole bunch of conversation about regulatory requirements and what they mean for APIs and, and security. Uh, so cool to see everyone. Hey, Texas, Germany. Kenya, uh, welcome everybody to, uh, to the session. Um, Chad, love to get a little bit of uh, your background and you say hi for uh, for the group. For the group. Yeah, hey everyone. Uh, my name is Chad Small. Um, you know, like Dan said, I'm currently at uh, Purist. It's a subsidiary of United Health Group. Uh, we were acquired a couple years ago. Uh, started up in 2017, and my my background's been kind of grew up in application development and then moved into uh, kind of HIPAA regulated healthcare startups. Uh, and then that, that turned into kind of the technical operation areas with security around infrastructure, cloud, uh, data operations, as well as kind of traditional IT technical operations. Um, glad to be here. Yeah, really glad glad to have you here, Chad. Especially someone sort of on the front lines of, of you know, healthcare and privacy and and accessibility and, and all the things that that you must be uh, dealing with. Uh, and Andrew, um, love for you to share a little bit about yourself and Clearwater and uh, and your background. Sure, sure. Good uh, good morning, good afternoon, everybody, and really really happy to be here, uh, Dan, with you and Chad. Um, as, as Dan mentioned, I'm the Vice President of Compliance and Privacy at, at Clearwater Compliance. Um, we're, a, we're a leading uh, consulting company focused on, on healthcare, focused on cybersecurity, privacy, and, and compliance uh, needs and issues. Really, I, yeah, I started my career really as a, as a lawyer and investigator with uh, the HHS Office for Civil Rights, uh, worked on uh, lots and lots of, uh, of cases involving uh, HIPAA compliance, uh, civil rights compliance in the healthcare context. Uh, and then I left and spent a number of years building uh, privacy programs and, and research compliance programs and you know, developing, you know, third party, you know, supply chain risk management programs and uh, and then have been with the overall Clearwater company for, for about six years. I was, uh, we were, uh, went through a merger and acquisition, was with a company called Synergistech and, and we're now uh, one one bigger, happy, happier family with, uh, with Clearwater. So happy to, really happy to be here and, and talking with everybody today. Um, appreciate you both making, making the time here. Um, and for everyone that's, that's dialed in, um, love to get your questions uh, throughout the session, so so don't be shy. Uh, I'll try to, to flag them when I see them in, in the chat. Um, we'll definitely have a conversation here, and 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 we'll field questions as we go, or or uh, pick them up here at the end as well. So so let's talk about the topic here, right? And and, and the title you see here is API security in the healthcare sector. And what interests me about this topic is what appears to me um, as a non healthcare um, person, so security person, is what feels like a, a competing demand uh, that's being placed on healthcare providers, insurers, payers, everyone in and around the space. Um, and these competing initiatives seem to be, on the one hand, to ensure the protection and, and security and privacy of this sensitive you know, patient data, right? PHI, patient health information. But on the other hand, we've got new uh, demands that say, wait a minute, but you can't just lock this all down and put it in a vault, right? Like patients have rights to accessibility to their data, right? So it feels to me like we've got this, this, um, this tension between, you know, privacy and accessibility. And, and I'd love to you know, dive into that with, with both you guys and, and kind of 
relate that to what does that mean for APIs? Like, what does that got to do with, with APIs, period, right? Um, and so I imagine that'll come out here. So, so I'm going to start with you, Andrew, um, to help us understand, like, what are the requirements? What is this regulatory environment? Maybe let's start with let's start with the privacy side because I think people will be more familiar with that, and then we'll, we'll we'll shift into the accessibility side. So, so help us understand the, the privacy requirements and what's behind them, and what kind of teeth do they have? Yeah, sure, happy to. So, you know, one thing I, I usually like to start out by you know setting a framework or setting a foundation for you know when we talk about privacy, we talk about security, you know. Really, what do these two things mean? Um, because I, you know, we we use them in similar contexts. I think we we see them as similar terms, but there are some differences. And um, you know, just at a very high level, I think what's important to understand is that when, when we're thinking about privacy, we're thinking um, we're we're talking a lot about governance, right? We're talking about how how an organization, an entity, a, a person, an office is thinking about how they are protecting the privacy of, of people or, or, or of others. Um, and when you think about security, you're, you're thinking about, okay, well, we, we've thought about how we're protecting the privacy of, of, of their information. Now, how do we, how do we manage it in a secure, uh, in a secure fashion? Um, so, you know, privacy is really guiding, you know, these, these ideas about um, you know, whether it's patient privacy, you know, consumer privacy, data protection, um, you know, really guiding some of the, the thought process behind what, what kind of data we're protecting and, and why. Um, and, you know, Dan, as you, as you sort of alluded to, there's, there are uh, a lot of uh, rules, laws, frameworks out there that have really tried to address, uh, you know, how organizations should best protect the privacy of, of people. Um, really the foundational one that we think about in the healthcare context is of course HIPAA. Um, HIPAA is also a, a very old uh, old law at this point. We're, we're coming up on the 30th anniversary in just a couple of years. So okay. it's, uh, it's, been around, <laughs> it's been around for a while. Um, it's had some, you know, some edits and amendments over the years, but not a whole lot. And, uh, but it's really been our guiding principle. And, and in that space, HIPAA, of course, apply, really applies to a certain type of an entity and, and, and doesn't apply to lots of others. Uh, so because of that, because of some of those differences, we've seen other laws and rules pop up uh, around, you know, both at the federal level around, you know, student information. We, we see it around uh, federal information. We see it at, at the state, you know, at the state law level as well. Um, and, you know, happy to dive, you know, deeper into any of those, but I think you know, really just setting the stage for, you know, how we talk about uh, thinking about privacy of, of data is, is, I think, something that, that's important to, to discuss as we sort of start our conversation. Yeah. Um, and and for, for my benefit, certainly, you know, hopefully for others, on like, um, where does high trust fit into this? Is high trust a whole separate regulation or is it um, kind of uh, related to HIPAA? It's um, it, so high trust is a is a framework. Uh, so it's a it's a it's it's a, um, a a group of people. An organization got together many years ago and tr tried to think about okay, we have you know whether we have HIPAA, whether we have PCI responsibilities, whether we have responsibilities under under NIST because maybe we're a federal contractor. We have all of these different you know essentially privacy and cybersecurity uh, laws that may apply to the data that's that is running through our systems and uh, and so the the organization got together uh, i trust group got together and, and said well let's can we develop a framework that that tries to address you know either all of these different rules and, and regulations and controls or at least as much as we you know as much as an organization can uh, it's a voluntary framework it's uh, it, it's it's something that we see uh, many organizations adopt as part of their risk uh, their risk analysis uh, framework, um, and uh, and we've seen lots of conversations, especially over the past couple of years, as as HHS and, and Congress have looked towards you know what what effective security practices look like, um, and uh, and high trust has certainly been one of those uh, one of the frameworks that has been you know in the conversations about 
what what successful management of of data uh, can look like. And and yeah, I'll, and, I'll jump. I was just going to jump in on kind of that. Yeah, yeah. The, the one way I one way I have experienced it, and I, kind of how I describe it to people. Right? Some people are more familiar with the payment card industry and the PCI uh, kind of certification process. If you're going to hold payment data, um, I think you know Andrew, like you said, the healthcare industry said, "Hey, can we?" It, it started as that high trust. Where can we get a framework? It's, you know, has elements of the HIPAA security rule and privacy rule, notification rule kind of involved. And then layer in NIST and ISO and these other frameworks and called it, you know, the high trust common security framework. And being gotcha. in healthcare and kind of coming through that, we latched onto that just because investors are our customers. It, it's kind of a, again, it's not, uh, uh, a regulatory requirement, but it's it's the group kind of consensus. Got it. Again, not required, but sure. people in in the health care industry are kind of gravitating. So, yeah, and I I see here in the in the chat, Mike. Thanks. It, it's it's similar to like you know a NIST eight hundred dash fifty three. So it, it's this is one of the things I always found confusing about HIPAA, right? Because I see people claim, you know, maybe it's more marketing, like to be HIPAA compliant, as if there's some notion of a certification a stamp that you <laughs> sure. can achieve for, and, and and is that right, Andrew? Like there's no, if someone says they're HIPAA compliant, that doesn't really mean anything per se. Yeah, yeah I mean, one one good sort of example from the, you know, from the news recently is, is you know, I, I think a lot of us probably saw the news about GoodRx and, and the FTC really, really going after GoodRx uh, around some of its privacy policies and, and security practices. And one of the things I noted as I looked through, uh, through the resolution agreement, um, it has screenshots and I encourage other people to, to sort of go through it and look at it because it's interesting. There's screen captures and other other uh, other items from the GoodRx website, and and one of the things that uh, that used to be on the front page of GoodRx that is no longer there is a uh, was a seal that said HIPAA certified, <clears throat> and I, I think it it's you know on some level it's it's of course a marketing you know a, a, a marketing opportunity. A lot of people like to have something like that on their website to say we're you know hey we're a company that takes you know, HIPAA or privacy or security seriously. Um, however, there is no HIPAA certification that that is uh, that is put out by the federal government, um, and uh, and it's it's an evolving process, right? So we know that that within the HIPAA rules, we're required to do regular assessments and analyses of, of our environments and. And it's not, you know, it's not something that you can just say, well, we, you know, we did this in, in May of 2022 and we don't need to do this again because now we're, yeah. now we've figured it out. Yeah. Um, you do this every year or every, you know, periodically. I suppose the only real HIPAA compliance is, you know, lack of violations, lack of, of penalties, right? Lack of breach of, of, of privacy. Uh, Cause that's where the teeth really are, right? Like if there is a breach, if there is a sure. violation of privacy, the, the penalties are pretty, pretty massive as I understand it. And, and yeah. so let's, let's talk about the other side of the coin here, right? The accessibility. So I, I bet fewer people on this call are familiar with the cures act. Um, so can you help us, you know, understand what it is and the course, you know, specifically around interoperability? Uh, sure. Yeah. Happy to happy to dive in, and then you know, Chad, please feel free to jump in as well. Um, you know, in a in somewhere in 2015 or so, um, HHS put you know Congress put together a, an appropriations bill, and uh, the the genesis behind this was was this idea that you know, and you mentioned this when you were kicking things off, Dan. There's there's some tension uh, between uh, Federal, and we'll talk federal requirements specifically, but there's tension in federal requirements around uh, a rule like HIPAA, which says we, we have to protect data, we have to secure it, we can only share data in certain, in certain instances. And in fact, HIPAA, does, HIPAA really doesn't expressly force or mandate the sharing of data 
except to the patient and and to HHS. Otherwise, you know, all of the data sharing that that can happen within the HIPAA uh, HIPAA context is is permitted. It's not required, and there's lots of prohibitions and and lots of things that we can't we can't do in terms of sharing data. Uh, we of course know that there have been on the other side of the coin lots of federal initiatives, whether it's it's grants, whether it's other types of federal requirements that have mandated the sharing of data. We know that uh, we're encouraged under the Affordable Care Act and, and others other rules to to share data to to receive certain types of awards, and some of that data may be may be data about patients, and it may be identifiable data about patients. And so there's this tension around, well, do we, do we just lock everything down? Is that, the, is that the right way to approach this? Or do we open everything up? Is that the right way to approach this? And, and so 2015 or so, they, they really started, you know, Congress started really diving into this question. And, and one of the, you know, they, they sort of came out with two different ideas. And, and one was, you know, let, let's put together a rule that uh, that require that essentially requires the sharing of data in uh, in many cases that, that that in a way that doesn't run afoul of HIPAA, and then also uh, also in addition to that, HHS you know has an interest in only certifying uh, certain types of products that that are not blocking the flow of data. So that's where you have sort of this information blocking rule, the interoperability rule. Uh, one is saying, you know, sort of at a governance level, here's here's how we have to share data, and then uh, the other, more of a technical uh, technical requirement that you know, ONC HHS, we're not going to certify data unless we're not going to certify products that are exchanging data unless uh, you know unless they certify that they're not going to block uh, block the flow of information. So that's you know, when you think about 21st Century Cures Act, we're thinking about you know, in essence, these two different. Uh, these two different rules, uh, and and in fact, one point I'll add before I turn it back over, um, is that even though this is all within you know the federal HHS world, um, the the authority to investigate and and provide penalties and 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 potentially even audit is different. So we have the Office of the National Coordinator, which is on point for uh, looking into information blocking claims and complaints and and issues, and then we have CMS. On the other side, uh, that that's enforcing the interoperability piece, which is kind of a flow mm. from from what CMS has done under the Meaningful Use uh, standard. So there's good bit to talk about there, and and I I, I guess I'll just stop there and see Chad. Or yeah, no. Um, well, yeah. What I gathered from from you know reading up on this and what you've just shared is, um, you know. The, organizations must make this data not just accessible a la, you know here's a piece of paper with your records you know there you go but but electronically right and and there are even now api standards um uh, are you familiar with the fire the fire api fhi so is that help maybe give a little bit bit of background i i i understand it as as kind of a um, a, a standardized API for healthcare exchange? Is it mandated? Is it um, kind of an, a sort of voluntary type of uh, API to support? Yeah, it's, I mean, it's an interesting question. And Chad, I, I'm, I'm, I, I sort of dabble in this enough to be dangerous. And so uh, hoping that Chad has some, has some thoughts about this too now, this too as well. But um, yeah, when you think about FHIR, which um, you know, is is pronounced fire, but it's F H I R, and then H uh, L seven, which is the health level seven. These these are uh, these are data exchanges and and technology that that have been you know they they're fairly new. I think fire's been around since twenty twelve or so. Um, H L seven has been around a little longer, and and these are essentially standards that uh, that. Uh, provide mechanisms to 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 help transmit the flow of of uh, of data and the reason why we we sort of have seen things like fire and hl7 percolate up in some of these conversations is that you we've we've seen hhs directly interact with these uh with these standards um we've uh, we've seen them encourage these standards over the years and, and adopt them so it's it, you know I, I don't know that I would say that it's a it's it's a required standard as much as it is you know to some extent and maybe this Chad you may 
disagree with this, but you know, it's it's almost sort of like a, a not a framework, but kind of like a NIST framework where you can say, well, this is you know, using NIST isn't you know, it may not be required for us, but this is something that has certainly been adopted and, and is used and is encouraged by the federal government, and uh, and so we're gonna you know we're gonna participate in this as well. Chad, I don't know if you have yeah, anything to I'll, add. Yeah, I'll jump. Them. So I, I sit on the outside of this one a little bit because um, this you know the cures and the interoperability. Uh, is mostly at this point targeted around provider hospital systems uh, kind of exchange of electronic health records. Um, I, I live in kind of a payer space more, so it's less impacted there at this point. The way I think about this is that uh, it's technology that's catching up where the standard to this state in healthcare has been very batch driven kind of uh, X12 kind of ET, EDI type ex file exchanges and there's the 837s and, you know the claims and the eligibility and these batch processes that's you know HL7 and, and fire are getting current you know and using uh, you know modern API exchanges which of course it should do so I feel like that's my analogy on those. And as soon as you do that, uh, you know, good old SFTP and exchanging files and PGP encrypting and 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 all the security controls around that and well established and yeah. um, but but now on this new frontier of uh, the interoperability and access to those APIs and limiting, you know, just kind of all the traditional security controls that you need to do around those. They're not prescriptive. They're going to be laid out uh, necessarily in these in these uh, standards like fire. But you know we can get into that along the way here on yeah. um, just just general API utilization in a in a health data uh, setting. Well, you know this is, this is a good segue here, Chad. We've been talking about the regulatory environments, right? You know HIPAA around privacy and Cures Act around data accessibility, and I want to link this to to APIs. Like, what's this got to do with APIs, right? And, and there was actually a, a comment or question here from from Jefferson about, you know, what's the impact around like California, you know, CCPA type stuff. Um, and it seems to me there's a huge correlation, or you know, huge connection between privacy and APIs. And if we look at the the breaches that have been happening, which are many, um, not strictly in healthcare, but across the industry, um, whether it's Coinbase or Peloton, you know, Venmo, LinkedIn, you name it, um, the the heavy duty API breaches uh, or heavy duty um, privacy breaches tend to have an API um, in play at some point, right? Because one of the sort of um, benefits of APIs is this you know, very seamless, you know, um, high speed, efficient access to data. Um, but if there are flaws in those APIs, then you've also just enabled, you know, high speed, efficient access to improperly authorized uh, data, right? And so um, it seems to me APIs are at the center of, of this conversation, right? If you're gonna achieve privacy and accessibility, it's really going to involve a conversation around APIs. So, so for you, Chad, you know, as someone on the front lines, you know, um, whether it's fire or your own APIs, right? Um, you know, how are you interpreting these requirements and how is that turning into priorities for you and your team? Yeah, so let me see if I can unravel this a little. So uh, to bounce it on the, off the, like the California, the privacy element of that, that those tend to be uh, pretty, ex uh, explicit around personal you know, privacy. And again, we're using the high trust framework. That's an element that we can kind of carve in to our control set and make sure that we're, we have the right kind of privacy and security controls in place around that particular state that the California just kind of started that and it's, it's extending into many other states and Andrew 
could talk about that, but, but uh, it's not going to uh, get to the technical security controls that need to be in place. They're, they're generalized. And so it starts to become, uh, you know, the, the, the layers of security as soon as you're going to present some API, which, you know, I, I can talk about, uh, you know, you know, uh, IP restrictions, uh, next generation WAFs, um, uh, uh, like uh, SCA and vulnerability libraries, uh, mm -hmm. SAS, uh, secret scanning. Uh, a really big one for us early was, and, and in some of these breaches, when you look at them, is the role-based access to the API. And yeah. again, minimum necessary access for a given endpoint or a given role and how far uh, they can go with that. So uh, that's a really important uh, kind of application security yeah. step. Uh, to have in place. There was a there was a question earlier. Um, I think is there in uh, what level of authentication and authorization is available for healthcare sector and kind of you know building on that question. This seems to be one of the biggest issues when we look at real world breaches, uh, especially as a result of an API. Is this distinction between authentication, where there's typically you know pretty strong authentication, right? We're making sure that. Dan is actually Dan when he's trying to access this API. Um, but we've seen many, many examples where authorization isn't effectively implemented, where, you know, I'm suddenly able to access this API, but by the way, I can look up my records, but I can look up yours and my next door neighbors and, and Michael Jordan's too. So, um, you, you know, is this something that, that you guys are seeing or, or you know, how, how do you handle this distinction between authentication and, and authorization. Yeah, I mean, so again, you know, I'll, I'll say we have hundreds of endpoints in our platform. Uh, just just call it six or seven hundred, and against those endpoints, we have over a hundred kind of role distinct roles on what certain um, credentials you know, authentication can get you to authorize into those hundred different subsets of access. So as soon as you have hundreds of roles against hundreds of endpoints, okay, how are you gonna not regress and fall into one of those breach notifications? Yeah, well- um, it's, not, it's not trivial. No, I and mean, it seems like the permutations are endless. When I mean, you said six, seven hundred endpoints, and you know, I don't remember how many different role types and so forth, you know, and all the different commands that you can run and you know methods and so forth. It seems to me there's a heavy duty testing element here. Would you agree with that? Like you know, actually, you know, attack simulating or pressure testing or however, whatever you want to call it to make sure there aren't these logic flaws creeping into your into your application. Yeah, and you know, I'm not, I know, AppySec University here, but just take away like the tool back to 10 years ago. I mean, this isn't new on web application before APIs or other, you know, this, you, you, you know, you wanted to have unit test coverage across all those uh, different variations of cross client, cross user, cross whatever subsections you're slicing your API into, um, you know, if you're doing it right and we, you know, we're a continuous delivery type shop, uh, that has to be automated. You're not gonna say, hey, you know, let's go manually test thousands, tens of thousands of different combinations yeah. of all of this because we changed a few classes and API endpoints. And so that that testing, as you said, has, needs to be automated. It sounds like it needs to be um, as you know, part of the CI/CD pipeline, as, as you said, right? Like something that gets evaluated just alongside, you know, functional testing and performance testing. You're you're advocating for security testing that that gets automated in CI/CD. Is that right? 
Absolutely. You know, and you can go build that with JUnit or whatever unit testing framework you want to use. Yeah. Um, but it would take, take some doing. Yeah. Um, or you can use, you know, other things uh, to, yeah. to optimize that. Yeah, absolutely. Um, and there was a comment here from Mike about visibility. We hear a lot about API visibility, having a proper inventory. So I'm curious, like from a governance perspective, do you set sort of a standard procedures and processes to avoid things like, you know, unknown APIs making it onto, you know, into, into, you know, public accessibility. Like how do you make sure that you've got control over all these APIs that are getting developed? Well, left, it's in the pipeline again. Um, you know, a new API comes on, it's going to be in that pipeline before it gets to prod. Uh, and it needs to be exercised against unit testing. So these are just kind of core uh, software development lifecycle yeah. um, principles at play. That that endpoint doesn't get in there with you know all the right SDLC things. There's been yeah. peer review. There's been static review, security, performance. That's all that, you know, ideally should be in the pipeline. Well, yeah, I mean, it sounds like this is, you know, you've got a well-documented and defined process, right? And, 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 you know, APIs should not be, you know, capable of getting past that process without, you know, you know, being, you know, tested and validated and, and evaluated and so forth. So, so let me, let me ask you a, a different line of question then. So, you know, a lot of times the, the issues that might be discovered, say, in the security testing, like let's say there's an authorization flaw or, you know, some other issue, an injection flaw, or whatever it might be, it seems like there's a collaboration that needs to happen between security and engineering. Um, would you agree with that? And, and if so, how are you going about making, you know, bridging that, uh, that divide? Um, yeah, I, I think... And, and I've learned over the years and, and not, again, I, I kind of grew up on the, the app dev side of the equation and yeah. those annoying security folks would, you know, kind of tell us what we were supposed to be doing. And um, it just, does, you know, there, there has to be a, a, even a, like an ownership or an acknowledgement of the importance of this element of maintaining software to a level. Um, it, it, it's just, and I, it's hard to get around that. If there's not the, the, I'll just use the word ownership and the awareness that the application development, application security is part of the engineering process. It's not a team that sits on the other floor or down the, down the room yeah. that is checking up on you know, security or the app dev engineers. Um, Cause yeah. that I found it just doesn't work. And it, it's important to get the tooling in the, the sequence of daily work of those engineers. It, 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 it doesn't work as well if it's something, you know, kind of off to the side yeah. or batch nightly or weekly or something statically yeah. in the flow of, my 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 repo my id my my um issue tracking this yeah. is how I, I daily work yeah i mean pipeline you, you talked about integrating this into the the pipeline and you know um it's interesting some of the sort of war stories we've had from you know working with clients and and, and folks is um number one you know pen testing you know once or twice a year just simply doesn't acknowledge the reality of the development pace, right? We're, we're releasing code weekly or daily or hourly, right? Um, so having testing that can actually integrate into the pipeline seems critical. Um, and, and and this need to um, foster these relationships. I've, I've met with many a security team that, you know, don't know what a gateway is, right? Or what a swagger file is or where the APIs are, who manages them. So it, it feels like there's a, a really critical need to, to 
foster those relationships between the security team and and dev. And in fact, um, it's been interesting to see with AppySec University, um, you know, our sort of lead course has been around pen testing, but our, our upcoming course is really, it's just called API Security Fundamentals. And we've seen a lot of interest from developer communities um, on, on having that level of security knowledge and awareness to know what the OWASP top 10 items are and, and how these real world breaches are succeeding and why it's getting through the WAF and everything else. Um, and so, you know, it feels like training is, is you know, a key element here, right? Um, not just training on the security side, but training on, on the, the dev side. Is that something that you've you know implemented at all over there at Shuris to, to make sure engineers have a solid understanding of the risks that come along with APIs? Um, yeah, um, there, there's an element, um, and you know, uh, one, one thing, yeah, uh, part of that becomes you know, uh, training is only as kind of good of, as the engagement. Um, so, yeah. to put a kind of a course out and you spend two hours on something like that, that's uh, if an engineer doesn't engage in that, um, it, it's not as um, Interesting. I mean, it's important to get fundamentals, you know, when you're at like an OWASP, if you're, if you're a, a software engineer in today's world and, and, and you're not aware of kind of OWASP top 10 type things, yeah. you know, that's a gap. So that's one thing. One of the other things we've done is uh, kind of introduced um, kind of champions and, and a guild around. So, so we have lots of different, um, uh scrum teams and then interested parties on call it appsec join our appsec guild and we have the conversations we have the awareness around the, you know the things we're talking around around api security and then they take that back to the teams and we just try to get that flywheel going uh in that way too and then to have a kind of a a key API security champion that, that that's part of their role. They're incented around that, uh, uh, continually improving that is, is another role that we've had. It's, yeah. it's been really productive. And I'm curious, actually, Andrew, like in, in, in your, you know, engagements with clients and, and the like, you know, are you seeing a divide between security and, and development? Is that something that, um, that you know organizations need to really tackle head on yeah 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 i mean absolutely i mean we see um you know when when things are working really well from an overall compliance perspective you have these you know you have these different skill sets and offices working together to to make to, to build and to test and to validate and uh and to do all the things that that you know, Chad is 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 leading in his organization, and um, you know, I think I saw somebody mentioned in the you know in the chat thread, you know, the 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 importance of you know, as Chad was talking about training, but you know, training the developers, making sure that people you know have an understanding and and a deep appreciation of of you know not just how to facilitate the flow of data, but but also how to how to do that in a way that. Uh, it minimizes, you know, any any security or privacy issues, but but also minimizes any any risks to the organization itself. Right. And um, you know, we've we've seen issues where, you know, d developers that haven't been thinking about it that way have, uh, you know, can can cause some heartburn. Yeah, it's it's and one of, you know, it's really interesting to see the the chat that's going on. A lot of conversation around um, visibility and and documentation. Um, we've seen this, uh, I know you have Chad as well. Um, documentation, you know, is, can be hit or miss, right? And, you know, it's, the reality is documentation doesn't exist strictly, you know, for developers benefit, um, or even, you know, for publishing an API so that our partners can make use of it. Um, it seems critical for security as well, right? So you, you know what you've got. It, so do you make documentation is that part of your like mandatory um you, know, you talked about sort of the, the the pipeline right and you know things have to go through various hurdles is documentation one of them 
Yeah, I mean, you can't, you know, open API, Swagger, that you can't. I kind of go back to the, uh, if you're, you, as much as possible, all your documentation is tied to your, your code base um, or your framework, you know, that comes out for that code base. Um, the closer it is to that code, the more real it is, the more it'll be kept up to date. Yeah. If you're off on a wiki, there are times, you know, that that helps, but anything that is manual in nature is just going to, you know, be out of date the yeah. day you put it out there. So absolutely, you know, that that's a key component is around APIs is, you know, that API documentation that comes off of the code base that can be, um, uh, you know, uh, there are varying degrees of that, but there's yeah. just a, a yeah, basis sure. of, of the I, base of that to exist. I know we've been talking strictly about healthcare here, but um, for you, Andrew, like, you know, interestingly enough, I was talking to a bank the other day and I mentioned this webinar we had coming up and he said, oh, I'm definitely going to sign up um, and, and hopefully uh, he's on the call now. But um, I said, really? Um, I said, you're, you're a bank. What? You know, he goes, oh, we've got HIPAA concerns. So that was eye opening to me. Um, is that eye opening to you, Andrew, or actually um, HIPAA has, you know, has pretty long reach? Uh, well, I, I think it's I mean, I think it's a, a testament to, to, you know, this person and his organization, um, you know, in, in thinking about some of these things, because I, I don't know that, you know, I don't know that uh, there are a lot of, of entities and organizations, you know, outside of healthcare that, that are really thinking deeply about about HIPAA unless they they know that they are a, a vendor or business associate, for example. And and that sort of leads, you know, leads us to the discussion around banks. You know, there's there there are opportunities certainly when um, you know when HIPAA could apply to a bank, you know, both if if it's serving as, you know, as a business associate uh, to to a covered entity, so to to a health plan, a, a covered healthcare provider. There's also some conversations around uh, around the EFT piece, right? So when you know when you have when you have certain types of, of you know electronic funds being transferred, um, you know from a you know from a covered entity to a to a bank or, or vice versa, um, you know I think there's been you know there's been questions out there for some time as to whether or not that that transaction you know may have uh, may have implications. You know that that sort of start to dive into to HIPAA standards a bit. Um, so I think it's certainly something that organizations, you know, that banks, um, you know, other organizations should be thinking about if they are, you know, if they're interacting with uh, with entities that are covered by HIPAA. Um, but I would say particularly, you know, focusing, you know, surely needs to be focused on those those groups that that are providing you know, directly providing services yeah. uh, for or, or on behalf of, of these covered entities. Yeah. Um, <clears throat> well, I think we're, uh, we'll, we'll wind it down here. I love the conversation here, guys, um, and incredibly grateful for, for both of you for, for sharing your perspectives, hopefully for everyone that, that dialed in, um, learned a thing or two about, you know, what the, what the landscape really looks like um what the uh, what the challenges are and, and 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 how that applies uh here to uh to api specifically um so chad really appreciate it thank you so much for sharing your your views uh and, and andrew as well um a, a little shout out for um for appisec uh university here um i you know most of the folks uh here are, are probably pretty familiar with it but uh, just in case you're not um Appisec University, it's a completely free um, university, really focused on um, helping people become API security experts. Um, we've, uh, as you can see, we've got, you know, gosh, close to 40,000 students now, um, really covering the whole globe, um, Fortune 500 down to, you know, small, um, small shops. Our flagship course is the API pen testing course, um, but look out next week as we're going to be launching the API security fundamentals course. This is a really great, you know, two hour intro to a lot of the topics we've been talking about. We'll, we'll dig into the OWASP top 10 and real world breaches in depth um, and really the whole security landscape. And we'll be following that up with a, an OWASP API top 10 course. 
uh, as you may know, um, the, the API top 10 is being updated this year and we'll be covering that the new edition here in our course as well. Um, all our courses uh, include um, certificates. So, you know, we love to see them on, uh, on people's LinkedIn. It's one of the most gratifying elements of, of this job. Um, our course is taught by, by Corey Ball, an absolute uh, phenomenal leader in, in, the, in the API security space. So that's my little plug for, for API Security University. Um, appreciate everyone that, that joined us here today. Love to see the exchange and uh, the networking and uh, all the kudos to, uh, to Chad and, and, uh, and Andrew here. So thanks again. We'll, we'll call it here and um, we'll look forward to our, our next webinar. Stay tuned. Right. Thank you. Thanks, everyone.